Hi everyone, my name is Era and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates and entertains you. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Hi everyone, this is Era your host. As you know, I've been working really hard to get great guests and deliver good content to you. Now, I need your help with three things. Number 1, Give this podcast a 5 out of 5 review on whatever platform you're listening to, whether it be Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts. Number 2, please sign up for the newsletter. There'll be special benefits for just newsletter followers and follow all our social media platforms. Really want to get the word out to a growing audience. And number 3, join the VIP Fans program where you will get benefits like personal shoutouts on the podcast, producer credits, and the chance to speak with me one-on-one. and or private group discussions with guests I've had on the podcast. That's awesome, right? So get more details on my website at the talmocreator.com or reach out to me at hello at the talmocreator.com. Thank you guys. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Talmo Creator. Today I have a very special guest on the podcast. Um Thiru Vignaraja joining me all the way from Baltimore, uh Maryland, um uh, I guess in the US. and just a bit about Thiru before he kind of let him speak about himself is he's an American lawyer and politician uh he was previously the deputy attorney general of Maryland also a federal prosecutor and president of the Harvard Law Review uh he's now a litigating litigation partner at the law firm DLA Piper in Baltimore so basically he's a big shot and he's also been the lead attorney for the state of Maryland on post conviction appeals of uh, one of the big cases there um with Aiden Said which I might be pronouncing correctly who was convicted of a high profile uh murder of Haymin Lee. Did I get that right Thiru? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I've introduced Thiru. I've been really excited to kind of finally connect with him because he's super busy doing important things and uh he's uh finally been able to jump on the podcast. So Thiru, why don't you kind of introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your background, your upbringing and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm so excited to have a chance to talk with you and I think it's it's so important to emphasize how grateful i think the tamil diaspora across the world is that there are people like you that are not only connecting us um but giving us a chance to share our stories and to hear the stories of others um with similar backgrounds you know i um i'm very proud of my heritage um uh, my um my parents are connected to the us before i was born and i'll tell you about that in a second but i was born in sri lanka um came over when i was 3 years old my uh younger sister was 9 months old My mother had actually come to Baltimore before I was born. Uh she was a teacher at a very prominent high school here in Baltimore, Poly High School, a public school, um you know, very diverse uh school certainly today, um back in 1970. She returned to the uh place of her birth where the rest of her family had been. Um she ultimately settled down and married my father who uh was born uh in uh northern sri lanka as well um and they were both teachers at good shepherd in colombo and uh had uh me at the age of my mother was 39 and uh had my sister when my mother was 42 um which was itself a little unconventional my mother my sister and i like to say was born a century before her time uh you know she was a rebel she uh you know didn't want to settle down uh like all of her sisters and brothers she had gone and become a math teacher before math and you know women were in the same sentence um and she came off to the US initially by herself in her 30s unmarried uh and came to this town called Baltimore um it's just about 45 minutes north northeast of Washington DC uh south of New York City and um when she got back and got married and had us i think their plan of course was to to live a life and build a life there but of course the troubles were beginning and um in 1980 uh they were we were some of the lucky ones um we started as so many immigrant stories in america do in the basement of my cousins in the bronx uh my father was working at a factory my mother was taking care of us but also reaching out to some of her contacts at that high school in baltimore she explained that she was still a teacher that she was married that uh her husband my father was a teacher and they were desperate for jobs and baltimore gave us a chance uh my mother who had started at poly uh, took um went back and got her phd at the age of 62 and finished her career 
teaching at Morgan State University, which is a historically black college here in Baltimore. My father taught at a number of high schools, which in the international audience will not mean much, but they were some of the toughest schools in Baltimore, Edmondson, Frederick Douglass High School, Southern High School. And he finished his career just a couple of years ago at Western High School. Um, they're both in their 80s now. My father, when he retired just a couple of years ago, was the oldest teacher teaching in the state of Maryland. He was 80 years old, he retired. My mother was much more sensible. She retired at an at a, at a, at a, a appropriate age. And um, that was the tradition in which I was raised. Um, you know, a tradition of gratitude for what we had been given a chance to see and to do, um, a tradition of hard work, um, a tradition of family and faith. We went to a temple, we were raised Hindu every Friday. Um, uh, I went from Woodlawn High School, uh, very um, tough public high school here in Baltimore, um, to Yale for college and Harvard for law school. I was one of the lucky ones. And uh, between college and law school, I uh, did a jaunt at McKinsey. Um, uh, spent some time in India and Africa uh, as part of the work there, and ultimately went to law school thinking I was going to become a law professor. Um, I um, had really taken a minute to find my voice, um, going from a tough public school in Baltimore to an Ivy League university at Yale was a very difficult transition. I candidly had not prepared myself. I didn't know how to study the way that Ivy League students study. I didn't know how to write the way that Ivy League students had been taught to write. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a real mountain to climb. And I, and I wish I could tell you that I climbed it during college, I didn't. Um, really, I found a measure of confidence when I was at McKinsey and I found my voice at Harvard Law School. I told myself that I was not gonna make any more excuses. You know, I wasn't gonna miss class. I wasn't gonna blame my immigrant upbringing or my tough high school. I was gonna apply myself as best I could and see what happened. And I worked very hard. I was a very good student at Harvard. I was president of the Harvard Law Review, as you mentioned before. I went on to clerk for Judge Guido Calabresi, a very prominent judge in the New York area. He was the former Dean of Yale Law School. Then on to clerk for Justice Stephen Breyer, one of the great honors of my life. Um, and then I returned to Baltimore um, as a prosecutor. Uh, I was a federal prosecutor, city prosecutor. And then as you mentioned, uh, most recently deputy attorney general from the state of Maryland. Um, I have lived a very blessed life. One of the reasons I so appreciate the chance to tell this story is I am very grateful for the opportunities that I've had. And I think part of my responsibility is to make clear to the broader diaspora that stories like this are possible. Um, my, you know, I call them Amma and Appa. My Amma and Appa are not uh, doctors. They're not engineers. They're uh, a rare occupation for our culture. They're teachers. And um, we did not go to fancy, you know, uh, elite schools. We were, they were not private or preparatory schools. And nevertheless, my sister and I both had a chance to, to, to live our dream. And so much of it is built on the extraordinary story of my Amma and Appa. I, I did not live the American dream. My parents did. And they laid a foundation that made it much easier for, you know, someone whose English was my second language. I spoke Tamil first. Um, but it was you know, a, a far easier transition to come here when you're three than when you're 43, which is what my parents did. Um, that's an extraordinary journey. And for that, I am also very grateful. That's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot of different directions you can go there, but I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you, know, you kind of talked about why you want to do law and your background in education is very, uh, very impressive. So you went to Yale and Harvard. Why specifically did you target those schools? Like, was it, yeah, like what was your kind of mindset going into that? Yeah, you know, I um, I wish I could tell you that there was some, uh, you know, careful, clever, uh, calculating strategy to it. There wasn't. Um, I went to a high school where there was very little guidance for students that wanted to apply to Ivy League schools. Um, it was not out of um, confidence. Uh, it was out of ignorance that I applied to only one college. Um, I wanted to go to Yale because I had visited their campus and it was beautiful. I knew it was a great school. Um, at some earlier point, I uh, remember hearing that they had a great law school and I was not even uh, sophisticated enough to realize that the undergraduate experience was quite separate from the law experience here in the US. Um, and so I sort of wandered, I sort of stumbled into that first choice. Um, Harvard was a little bit more of a thoughtful choice. Uh, you know, it's, it's a 
it's a school that obviously has a national and international reputation. Um, it is a school that has, it's a very big class. So there's a very broad network and people from Harvard go into everything. You know, the, my, my sister went to Yale for college. She went to Yale for law school. And, you know, she was a Marshall Scholar in England between, she was, you know, we routinely refer to her as Vigneraja 2.0. You know, she's <laughs> the, the more refined version. But the, um, but the joke about Yale that us Harvard folks make is that that's where you go uh, to learn the theory of the law. You know, many of the people at Yale go on to become professors. Um, Harvard produces professors and politicians and public servants and prosecutors and corporate lawyers and, you know, the full range of occupations and vocations that one can build after a, a career in law or just a time in law school are represented at Harvard. And that was a very, very attractive thing to me. I don't think I realized how many different things I would go on to do, but in so many ways, Harvard was well suited to that a mosaic career that I have built because there are people that have gone from Harvard into uh, politics. There are people that have gone from Harvard into education, into law firms, into the public sector, so on and so forth. And so it made it easier to realize that all many, many doors were, 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 were open. You mentioned that the city of Baltimore really gave you guys, your family, this opportunity that you like wouldn't, would have had trouble finding elsewhere. So um, can you tell us about you know, what, what it was like actually living in Baltimore versus kind of, you know, I'm someone that lives in Toronto and um, I, I've never visited Baltimore, but I have a certain perception of Baltimore. Obviously that's like due to media or like things you watch in movies. So can you tell us about the difference of the real Baltimore that you've experienced and maybe like what, you know, people outside might see in the media? You know, um, Baltimore is a complicated city. Um, I don't know that there's another city in the United States that has a bigger distance between where we are and where we could be. Uh, we have routinely the highest per capita homicide rate in the country by an order of magnitude, uh, the highest rates of illiteracy, of high school dropouts, of heroin overdoses. Um, you know, we have the highest property taxes and some of the worst schools. I mean, it is a really troubled city. And in that respect, there's a lot to fix. And so if you're a person whose ambitions are tied to taking on, you know, grand challenges, um, Baltimore is a lightning rod for, for people like that, for people like me. Um, but it is also a city that has so much promise because of its history, because of its location, because of its culture, because of its anchor institutions. You are talking about a city that has the westernmost deep water port on the Eastern seaboard. Um, Hudson Harbor, New York City, is second. And that was a big part of Baltimore's history. We also have one of the most efficient international airports in the world, uh, BWI, the Baltimore Washington International Airport, named after Thurgood Marshall, a Supreme Court justice who's from Baltimore. Um, that's 15 minutes south of the city. You have anchor institutions like the NIH, the National Institute of Health, Johns Hopkins University, and the hospital, which I, is regarded as the very best in the world. Um, the University of Maryland, you've got uh, Fort Meade, you've got the Pentagon, you've got all of these institutions that are within a stone's throw of Baltimore. You've got this rich history, this diverse suburb, this affluent hub, um, and a location between the political and financial capitals of the world. Uh, no disrespect to it, great cities like Toronto and Vancouver, but to have Washington, D.C. to your south and New York to your north is a profound locational advantage. Um, and so in some respects, we stumbled into this. I mean, why are we in Baltimore? The fate of my family was tied to the city from before I was born. It was because my mother, you know, crossed an ocean um, and, and started teaching at this high school. Um, but now there is an opportunity in many ways to repay this debt that I certainly feel uh, to, to the city for giving my parents a chance. Um, and you know that's that's a lot of what my career has been built on. You talked about so much promise there in Baltimore. Like there's a big gap where, where it should be based on all these advantages that it has, and why it's not there. Maybe tell us a few reasons of like what you think could be long-term fixes or solutions to address kind of that gap between potential and you know where it is today. Yeah, I mean you know the 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 reality is that the 
impression that Baltimore, that people have of Baltimore nationally, globally, is framed around crime. The Wire, the show Homicide, um, the, the stories and headlines that we make, The Economist, USA Today, The Washington Post, uh, virtually every year now, label us at the end of the season as the deadliest city, the most lethal city, the most dangerous city in America. Um, we are one of the cities that is on the top 20 deadliest cities in the world. Um, you know, when you have a higher per capita homicide rate than countries in Central and South America and Africa, you must understand that the perception of the city is not divorced from the reality. Part of it is real. So I think turning that problem around is vital. It is an existential threat. It is the reason why so many people flee the city. You know, in, in America, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, and into the 80s, after Brown versus Board of Education was decided a case that desegregated public schools, a lot of urban centers saw white flight, uh, large white populations leaving for the suburbs and for the, the countryside. Um, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s in Baltimore, what we have seen is black flight. Um, we are today the only city in America that is declining in population and also smaller in 2020 than we were in 1920. We were a city of almost a million people that is now down to 593,000. And we lose about a percentage of our population every year because they just move out. And the biggest reason they give is crime. Um, so you have to, that is an existential threat to the city um, and it has to be reversed. But the other thing that you have to do is you have to do it in a responsible way. We live in a, uh, a, a modern era where you cannot arrest your way out of this problem. The, the strategies of mass arrests and zero tolerance that Rudy Giuliani pioneered in New York City, they will not work, they should not work, and they have collateral consequences, which we have learned of over the past few decades. You have to be a lot more strategic, a lot more sophisticated in identifying the root causes and also focusing your resources on the neighborhoods and the individuals and the gangs that can make a disproportionate uh, effect. I also think it's really important to do a fundamental redesign of our education system. Universal pre-K for every three and four year old. Um, you know, half of our um, girls and two thirds of our boys do not enter kindergarten ready for kindergarten. Um, they, they don't pass the kindergarten assessment test. Um, that's a huge problem if you're already behind before you've even started. Well, universal free uh, pre-K, pre-kindergarten for three and four year olds, I think would be vital. I also wanna make colleges free for graduates of Baltimore City public schools because so many of our families are pulling their kids out of public schools and putting them in expensive private schools or they're moving out to the county. Um, we have to have some incentive for children and their parents to stay in schools. Some of them are pretty good. Poly and School for the Arts, City, these are really well-regarded schools even today, um, but there's not enough of them. Many of our schools don't have, you know, you can't drink water from the water fountains because there's lead in the pipes underneath. Uh, many of them don't have heat or air conditioning, so they have to close for certain days in the winter and in the summer. I mean, that's, that's shameful in the most successful, you know, prosperous nation in the world that you've still got schools that you wouldn't tolerate in you know, in, in nations in, in Africa and, 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 and South America. You talked about an important thing, which is kind of this flight away from the city. So you went from a million in 1920 and in 2020, it's like half of that almost. That's like a huge economic impact when you think about tax base or like businesses. Um, how do you think about like addressing that? Because, you know, if you don't have money to fund the infrastructure around education or improving yeah. like schools or, you know, cities and like parks, you know, green spaces, like, how do you kind of get people to stay in the city or even attract young blood into the city too? You are articulating so well the vicious cycle that we found ourselves in, right? You are losing people, you're hemorrhaging uh, population. And as a consequence, your tax base is smaller. So there's uh, more expenses for fewer people and fewer people to finance them. Um, it just has to be reversed. And just to, to be precise, uh, in 1920, I think we were around 700,000. We mm -hmm. peaked in the 1950s around a million and then came down, but we are now today smaller than, than a century ago. Um, I think you have to start by making clear that housing is plentiful and affordable in Baltimore, that if the schools uh, could start turning around, that there's a great opportunity for a great education. Um, Washington, D.C. and New York City, you know, two of our sister cities geographically, 
are exceptionally expensive. They are no places to try to raise a family unless you know you're 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 a banker or you're you know you've got a a, a real um, nest egg for your family. So the opportunity to have an affordable city within a stone's throw, a train ride away from these two critical uh, metropolises, is is really alluring. Um, and I think once you bring people in, you can start, you know, uh, relying on it. We're just very wasteful. There's a lot of money that is just frittered away. It's inefficiencies. It's corruption. I often say it's not high grade corruption. Uh, oftentimes it's low grade incompetence. You know, we just don't carefully execute uh, the things that municipal government is supposed to do. And other cities have shown us that it can be done. Um, Baltimore is just not a good example of it. Because when you said that, you know, you have Washington to your south and New York to your east, great location and it's affordable. I think of now with COVID and kind of how it's changed the landscape of work where people can work from everywhere, anywhere. And if you can be close to those two great cities in an affordable city, yes, there might be, you know, challenges around crime or other kind of things, but I feel like there's a potential there to kind of maybe lure people in the tech space or people that are able to work from anywhere to live in a city like that, that has that potential, that affordability and proximity to great other cities too, so. You know, the, the, the global pandemic presented such an opportunity, even as it presented such obstacles and produced so many tragedies worldwide. Um, there is a chance to reset here in Baltimore. There's a, there's a chance, you know, when I think about why I am doing this, I obviously feel a, a, a deep debt of gratitude um, and feel like I owe it to Baltimore. Um, it is also because I want to help spark the renaissance of the city. You know, I think Baltimore is poised to become the greatest turnaround story in American history, to go from being the most violent city to a thriving, um, diverse, just city, a model for what cities could look like in the next century. What, a, what an honor that would be to be a part of. Um, and the pandemic in some respects caused people to reimagine and rethink how they wanted to raise their families, where they wanted to locate themselves, whether they could work remotely. And all of those questions that are in people's minds presents a chance for us um, to really reimagine what role we could play. Um, and you gotta get those fundamental problems corrected. You can't sell them on this dream if they're dodging you know, bullets and drug dealers um, and are sending their kids to, to awful schools. But if you can get those fundamentals right, um, you have a really prof you know, very attractive um, pitch that I think you can make. Right now, our pitch is pay twice as much in taxes uh, to have your children have a higher chance of getting carjacked or shot on the way to a school where they can't drink water from the water fountains. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, that I can't blame families for looking at that proposal and saying, you know, I'd, I'd rather settle elsewhere. But you reverse that and you start talking about one of the most diverse cities in America. You know, we have uh, a majority black city, uh, 62, 64 percent of our city is African-American. We have these great anchor institutions in the shadow of the greatest hospital um, to have a deep water port, the Fort McHenry. I mean, all these amazing parts of our of American history were here in Baltimore. Um, we just we have to live up to that potential, and 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 the pandemic in some respects, the 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 as the pandemic recedes, there is an opportunity to seize it, um, but it will take a vision and it will take a blueprint. And right now, I fear um, we don't have either. I think of uh, Detroit, kind of with um, you had this champion, and like say Dan Gilbert, who is the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, who is from Detroit, and he's kind of been one of I guess a few people really championing to kind of really change that perception of like downtown Detroit. I think he intentionally set up one of his offices for his companies in downtown Detroit and like bought houses and like commercial property. So maybe I guess the solution would be to find a Dan Gilbert that's from Baltimore that kind of wants to spark that change that he wants in Detroit, which I can definitely see happening in Baltimore too. So yeah, no, there's no question. There's a lot of different ways to get to where we need to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's telling, and, and I know this is an international audience. Uh, so I, just you know, reflect on the fact that so many American cities had the problems that I am describing are gripping Baltimore today. Washington, D.C., New York City, Oakland, Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, uh, New Orleans, Memphis. These are all cities that in the 80s were dens of violence. They were the epicenters of the drug trade. They had 
profoundly challenged schools. All of them were losing population. Um, and then in each and every one of those stories from Washington DC, 45 minutes away from here to Oakland, all the way across the country, each and every one of those cities um, through different strategies have found a way to endure their renaissance. Um, they're all growing now. Literally every one of those cities that I mentioned over the past 10 years is growing. Um, they are all hubs of economic activity. They have great schools. They have diverse populations. Certainly they haven't done it perfectly. Gentrification, the fact that you know poor populations have been pushed out as the cities became more prosperous, that's a cautionary tale that we have to guard against. But in some respects, Baltimore has a chance to write a story knowing that those evils lurk around the corner, knowing that these are some of the costs and consequences of becoming more prosperous and finding strategies to avoid them. I mean, that's the art, that's the magic. But my God, what a story it would be if you could become more prosperous and more diverse, that you could attract economic activity and also have a diverse, inclusive uh, housing arrangement. That would be a, a profound template for the world. You know, one of the things I read about you was, um, I guess you can confirm it is like, you know, you work at a big law firm and you do well, like financially, but like, I think one of the things I read about you is you still drive a Toyota Camry. Is this correct? And if so, like, why have you made kind of this decision? So when I was 16 years old, I passed my driver's test in a 1991 red Toyota Camry. Mm -hmm. And I loved that car. And uh, we drove it. It's still in the family. We, you know, we treat our cars like uh, members of the extended family. Uh, I, I drove that car until it crossed 300,000 miles. Um, it actually was stolen for a time and it was recovered. They, the person had gotten it from like 296,000 to 297,000. And then we, um, and I, you know, had the, the honor of crossing it into 300,000. And, and, you know, like I, I am, I am, um, I take faith and um, uh, these traditions seriously. I drove the 300,000th mile to the temple where we had a puja and like, you know, it's the care, the, I've never been in an accident in any of these cars, it took care of me. And so um, when I was clerking for the Supreme Court, um, you know, there's a, right after you get a bonus and it's a, it's a, it's a very generous bonus. You've now clerked the Supreme Court, you know, working for the government, including the Supreme Court doesn't pay very well, but you're now heading into the real world. And I took that and we put a down payment on the house and I bought myself a 2007 Toyota Camry hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it is, it, these cars are dependable. They're, they're like tanks. Um, look, I, you know, I, it, is, it is part of how I was raised. It is also, I think, a strategy to not lose sight of where we began. Um, it, it, you know, I, I've always thought that that trying to maintain your integrity, trying to sort of keep your feet on the ground, trying to remember where you come from, that's not just because some people have better angels on their shoulders than others. I think it's muscle memory. You know, you start eating at fancier restaurants and all of a sudden Burger King doesn't taste as good. You start, you know, uh, going to fancier cities and all of a sudden the park down the street doesn't look as nice. Um, I think it's important to remember that there is you know, beauty and reliability in all of this um, and to avoid the temptation. You know, I'm, I'm human. Um, I think it is, it, it's, it's important to, as long as you can, you, you can certainly make exceptions. Everybody should go on a great trip. Everybody should have you know, one nice car in the family. But uh, I think it's been important to me to overall try to live the life I was raised in um, to make sure that I don't suddenly, it doesn't go to my head um, because that is a real danger of success. I mean, I've, I've, I've endured a lot of successes. It's not been all been perfect, but I've had a very, very blessed life. And it, the risk of that going, um, you know, you know, we call it Navra, right? But it's not just that. It's allowing it to sort of seep into your psyche that you, you deserve something more. Um, as, as the saying goes, you know, my Amman Appa, they gave us um, everything we needed and nothing that we didn't. <laughs> so. I love the answer. Um, another interesting thing I read about you was like, you don't eat meat and drink or drink alcohol. I know, I know you took a, a, a glass of champagne, I think when Obama got elected or something like that, but, um, <laughs> did you, is that like, is that something you still kind of follow to, to this date? I think yeah, it's something around yeah. like discipline or something like that. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, if I sat down with a, with a therapist, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons I, I don't do it. You know, I was a, 
I was a voracious meat eater growing up. Um, I, I became vegetarian partly because I was uh, trying to get closer to my faith, mm. um, uh, partly for health reasons, partly for environmental reasons. But, you know, just after college, which is now, gosh, you know, <laughs> 20 odd years ago, um, I thought it was an important thing. And I, I tried very hard. It was very difficult. Um, uh, but then to, to use the foolish expression, I went cold turkey. I just stopped uh, as a New Year's resolution and it's stuck ever since. Um, you know, I, I still miss some things. I miss pepperoni pizza. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it has become easier with each passing year, right? There's so many vegetarian and vegan options now, you know, beyond meat and impossible burgers. These sort of substitute things are quite delicious. So it's become easier with each passing year. But I think that is, you know, rooted in some decisions that were important to me and my faith, you know, in my 20s. Um, not drinking, you know, I don't know that I have some vital moral reason. I'm sure that part of it is about discipline and, you know, main, ma maintaining it. Um, I have, uh, I've had a sip of champagne on four occasions. Um, I had a sip of something at a, at a sleepover in seventh grade. <laughs> uh, I, I, peer pressure and, you know, I, I, I was convinced that I was, you know, going to get in trouble and, you know, just about a sip of something. Then I had a sip of champagne um, when I became president of the Harvard Law Review. Uh, I had a sip of champagne at my wedding and I had a sip of champagne when I toasted my best friend at his wedding. Mm. Um, and so it's not some, you know, some moral absolutism. Um, I like the idea that I can reserve it for special occasions. Um, you know, I, it allows me to probably have longer hours of productivity. I'm sure there's, there's reasons like that. But, you know, it, it's just part of who I am. It's part of who I've been. Um, and it's, as a consequence, part of who I've become. So, you know, you talked about kind of, you know, on this road, you were one of the people that kind of made it or like the lucky ones to kind of escape kind of what growing up in Baltimore kind of entails where you kind of made it to Yale and Harvard and now you're kind of doing what you're doing. What's like a failure you would say, or I don't like that word, but, you know, failure, learn lesson, whatever you want to call it in like the last three to five years that you've kind of really learned from? Yeah. You know, um, politics is a, uh, a contact sport. You know, there it is a tough business. And um, one of the things that I think you have to learn is that you're not going to get everyone to love you. Um, and you have to become comfortable with the fact that partly because you've got motivated opponents, um, they will see the worst in you and they will spread that word. Um, and you have to understand that some of that is part of the game and the brinksmanship and the competition. Um, and some of it is, there's truth to some of it. You have to, you have to realize that the criticisms are, there's a kernel of something there that you have to take seriously. Uh, I'll give one example. Um, you know, I'm in my forties now, um, but I had some very serious responsibilities in my thirties. Um, and being a, a good manager was something that I, I strive to do. Um, but you have to learn that. There are certainly people that are more natural leaders than others, no question. But there are things that you learn. You find your voice, you find your approach. Um, and there were times when my strategy to try to inspire confidence among the people on my team was to represent that I knew a lot about the topic. But of course, if you're in the room with somebody who is a career expert, that doesn't inspire confidence. It undermines confidence. In you. Um, they want to see that you are aware that they are learned in this subject and that you have stuff to learn, uh, that you are cognizant that they um, should be guiding your decisions. That doesn't mean it's not ultimately your decision as the leader. Um, but understanding that you're not supposed to have the answer to every question um, I think is a, is a vital piece of this. Um, but, you know, I, I want to make sure people are clear. Um, when I went to college, there were really serious challenges. Um, you know, when you go from Woodlawn High School to Yale University, you're surrounded by people that have been educated, some of the finest schools in the country, in the world. Um, one of my college roommates went to a place called Deerfield Academy, a prestigious boarding school. Uh, another went to Cathedral in Mumbai, India. Um, another uh, was a, a public school in Minnesota. Um, he went on to be a Rhodes Scholar and uh, clerked on the Supreme Court for Justice Breyer. 
um, they're, they're just very impressive people around you. Um, and you can easily um, be overwhelmed as I was and be humbled by it. Um, the very first paper I turned in uh, in college, the, um, the professor, this is an English literature professor at Yale, he had feedback. All of the back of it was just a full page of feedback. And the last line was written up the side. And, and he expected you to read it in front of him. So he, he saw when I was turning it to see the last line. And his last line, which I will remember to my grave, was, this is nothing more than a half-assed attempt at a high school term paper. Do it over. And you know, you're talking to a kid that had gone to a relatively easy high school and had coasted, you know, everything I turned in, I turned in the last minute and got, you know, A's or A pluses on. Now I'm being told this isn't even, you know, good enough to submit. Um, and I wish I could tell you that I took that as motivation and turned around and learned how to write. I retreated. I thought I'd hit my ceiling. Um, it was a source of great um, frustration, but I, I just retreated. I didn't really recover for years. I was a very middling student in college. Um, and I think that the reason I share that is because um, I did find my sea legs at some point. I did find my voice, um, but it didn't come the next month. It didn't come the next class. It didn't come the next semester. It didn't come the next year. It came almost a decade later. Um, we grow up, we blossom at different rates. And if you then think you've blossomed, you have made a big mistake not realizing that there is always uh, something more to learn, uh, another way to grow. Um, and so certainly, I, you know, I, I, I hope I answered your question about sort of the recent um, things, but I, I think you have to remember that, that life is a very long journey and out of each of these stumbles, you will gain something that I think will provide you insight, wisdom, humility, um, all of which I think are important to being uh, a meaningful contributor to the, to the work on this earth. What would you tell your 16 year old self, you know, going through kind of all that you've kind of gone through, you had a chance to sit down with your 16 year old self growing up in, you know, um, I forgot the high school that you said, but if you had a chance to talk to him, what would you say, what, what would you tell him? It's a great question. Um, you know, I sometimes think my 16 year old self had a lot of wisdom. <laughs> uh, you know, he, uh, I speak of myself in the third person at your request, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he did what he loved. Uh, there was actually very little strategy to what I was doing in high school. I was the captain of my soccer and tennis team because I love soccer and tennis. I uh, made friends easy because I was nice to them because I was a nice guy. Um, I didn't think, oh, I have to do well in this class because I want to go to this or that college. It was just what I did because I found joy and fulfillment in it. You then sort of learn the real world and you start to have to think about the next step and you have to um, I think what I would tell him is that that original approach of finding joy in the things that you do and doing the things that genuinely fill you with purpose and with happiness, stay true to that course. Um, because not only do you then find joy in the things that you do, you end up being good at them. You know, when I left being a uh, you know, president of the Harvard Law Review and a Supreme Court clerk for Justice Breyer, I thought I was going to be a law professor. Um, and then I found myself in the well of a courtroom giving a closing argument in a homicide case. And I found joy in that. And I was good at it. Um, you know, running for mayor of Baltimore was the most fun, best professional year of my life. And looking back, I realized part of it is because I was doing what I was truly inspired by. I was talking about the biggest problems. I was talking to people of all different backgrounds. I, I, I'm an obvious extrovert. I, I like connecting with people. Um, it isn't work to me. Um, and I, I think there were periods in, in my career where you suddenly think you have to do something because that is necessary to then go do something else that you think is important. You know, you study, and that is actually not how I approached life when I was 16. It is how I approached life when I was in law school. You know, you have to do well in this class to get a clerkship, you have to get this clerkship so you can become a professor. Um, that is, I think, it was, I, I was successful at it. I, I, I don't regret it, but it wasn't as joyous a period as I was when I was 16 or as I am uh, uh, today. You know, I want to kind of, I meant to ask this to you earlier in the podcast, but you know, for those of us in Canada, I think we take for granted kind of, especially in Toronto, how concentrated 
and connected the Tamil community is because I could say probably the largest outside of, I think, uh, India or Sri Lanka. Um, how is the Tamil community like you grew up in like the Bronx or like New York City? I kind of know about that, but like Baltimore, what's like the Tamil community or like there or like Washington or like, you know, wherever you frequently go to? What's the community like? You know, it's very different today than it was when my parents arrived in 1980 or when my mother arrived in 1970. Um, when we arrived here in 1980, I think there were, you know, you could count on two hands the number of Sri Lankan Tamil families here in the area, which were obviously the first network. Um, Baltimore was not a destination city. New York, you know, Chicago, maybe those had a larger concentration. Um, that was hard. Um, and I, I can only imagine what a feat it was for my mother and father to navigate a world where there was really so little that was familiar. Um, today, there is genuine diversity. Um, you know, my parents, you know, were benefactors and continue to be benefactors to, you know, some of the temples here in Maryland. Um, when we got here in 1980, there wasn't a temple. Um, you know, there was a house that we went to pray in at, uh, on Friday nights. You know, the Morrigan Temple now here is in you know, several actually in the, in the neighborhood. Um, that itself, I think, is a measure of how much larger the concentration is, but it's still very disconnected. Um, you don't have the mosaic of ethnicities that you see in Toronto. Um, you don't have the large concentration of, um, of Sri Lankan Tamils, for example, that you see in Lancaster, or the large concentration of South Asians that you see in Edison, New Jersey. That's Lancaster, California, Edison, New Jersey. Um, Baltimore, the state of Maryland, is very uh, uh, disconnected. You know, I, um, I I can count on two hands the number of Sri Lankan Tamils that I personally know um, and interact with on a regular basis in Maryland. There's obviously many, many more um, uh, living here now, but it's not as connected as, as I imagine it is in Toronto and as I hear from my relatives uh, that are up there. On like the topic of learning, I know, you know, for you, you kind of went from, like you said, a tough Baltimore school to Yale and then Harvard. So learning is important for you. What is something like you do right now to kind of keep on learning? Like, do you read a lot? Do you listen to podcasts? And if so, like, what's a book or podcast that you would maybe recommend for those listening? Question. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I read more. Um, I find great joy in it, but it is hard. I'm not the fastest reader. Um, I read lots of things, you know, articles, newspapers, you know, cases every day. Um, the sort of short pieces, but a, a, a book, a recreational book is, is, uh, is difficult to find. Um, there's a, a man who went to my high school. Uh, he was a contemporary of mine. Um, he was not on the radar at Woodlawn High School. His name was Tanahisi Coates. He is, I think, one of the great writers of our generation. Um, and he wrote a book, uh, one of his very first books, um, Between the World and Me, which I think is not only one of the most beautifully written books that I've encountered, it also explains in ways that I don't know that I've seen another book do, um, the experience of minorities, the experience specifically of African-Americans here in this nation. Um, I, I have picked it up recently to reread it. And I think find just as much inspiration and wisdom in it today as I did when I read it once upon a time. Um, if I had to recommend one book, that would be it, especially for an international audience. Um, but you know, you learn from everything. I, I learn from talking to people and I talk to people about everything. Um, and that is always how I have been a learner. I'm sort of a, you know, a, a, a verbal learner. I think through problems by talking them through, I learn about issues by hearing them. Um, and that gives me even one more additional reason to talk to people of all different backgrounds and of all different disciplines uh, with all different interests. And that, that is, I think, a, a source of great energy for me. Who is one person in the global Tamil community and maybe one person that isn't Tamil that you admire and why? So, you know, the easiest answer would be my mother and father, uh, and, and I can't skip over them. I, I don't think, you know, many of us have these stories and each of them is unique. Um, but the, the idea that my mother who, you know, was a rebel before her time would come over by herself to a foreign city and teach math. If you look at the Poly High School yearbook in 1970, uh, my amma is in a sari. 
she's in a sari uh, in this black and white faded yearbook. And I only noticed it recently, you know, she's wearing, and, and the idea that she came across an ocean in search of a better life and still dressed in a sari when she went to a high school in Baltimore is just bewildering. And that she then came back without a car, you know, before we had the Camry, they took the bus. Um, and um, my father who, you know, they're still sprightly and as engaged and energetic as they ever were. The, the idea that he came over, you know, from the, the humble beginnings he had in Sri Lanka and worked until he was 80 years old, long after he didn't have to. Um, you know, my sister and I, we could have taken care of him. And yet he, every summer would say he was gonna retire. And then by the end of the summer, he would go back. Um, <laughs> and I think they, they can't be missed, but I, I'll tell you, I think the person that I find draw the most inspiration from within the global diaspora is still family, is my sister. Um, uh, I, I joked before that, Krishanti, um, Krish, as she's referred to, is um, is Vignaraja 2.0, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, she was the, you know, she was the captain of her soccer and tennis team as well, but she was better than me. Uh, she went to Yale and Yale Law School. She was a Marshall Scholar. She was um, policy director for Michelle Obama, um, and I I would point to two things about um, who she has become that I think are so inspiring for me. She is now the head of uh, the, the, the largest faith-based uh, refugee and immigration nonprofit in America, the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services. She's the first immigrant, first refugee, first non-Lutheran to run uh, this faith-based uh, organization. And she's grown it from you know, being on the, on the cusp of the red to tripling in size. And it's an extraordinary voice that she has br brought to the immigration debate, which is so alive here in America. Um, before that, she ran for governor of Maryland. And one of the first things she did, because she announced her candidacy when, with a three-month-old, Alana, her daughter, was um, uh, an infant. Um, and in front of the first apartment that we lived in when we first came here, she announced her candidacy for, for governor. Um, and part of it was because in 2018, just a couple of years ago, we have eight congressmen, two U.S. senators, a governor, a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, and a comptroller. Those are the elected statewide positions in Maryland. Every single one of them was a man. And my sister said, we got to do better. Um, and her first commercial was the first commercial in the nation that it did this. It went viral. Um, it was a commercial where she was breastfeeding Alana on camera. And part of it was to destigmatize it. Part of it was to remind people that she's proud of being a mother, proud of being a woman. Um, and that was sort of just who she was. In so many ways, she inherited my, my amma's gene of wanting to be a rebel. Um, and then more recently, um, she, um, she uh, was diagnosed uh, with very early stage breast cancer. Um, and she has bravely confronted it. She is doing great. Uh, it, Truly, I mean, it's had, 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 you know, wonderful sex, success, knock on wood, um, and is so healthy. But that too, she decided to share with the world um, because she wanted to destigmatize that. Um, you know, that is a level of courage that is uncommon in people. It is particularly uncommon in a, in a South Asian person, I think. You know, there's so much cultural baggage that comes with both of the things that I just mentioned, breastfeeding in public, talking about breast cancer in public. And part of what she was trying to do was to break that barrier down too. Um, she's doing great. I joked, I, I played tennis with her recently. I was recovering from a hamstring injury. She was recovering from breast cancer <laughs> and she beat me 6060. -6 so uh, she's, she's doing just fine. You know, uh, temper the sympathy that you have for her. Um, but she is a source of um, great inspiration for me, for my family, uh, for her daughter, I think for all of us. Um, and I hate to keep it so local, but I, I think that she is uh, the person I, I, I certainly most admire uh, within the Sri Lankan diaspora. And how about somebody that's non-Tamil? You know, um, uh, the two people that I grew up looking up to um, in the law and in the world um, were uh, Thurgood Marshall and Mahatma Gandhi both lawyers that broke so many barriers. Um, and I think that is still true. 
Um, Mahatma Gandhi feels like I'm sort of answering your first question. So let me actually tell you about Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, a quick story, but it'll tell you the, the measure of this man, uh, went to Frederick Douglass High School, where my father taught many years later. Um, you know, inner city Baltimore Public High School. Uh, he was an average student, graduated above average, went to Lincoln University, the first historically black college in the country, was an above average student, graduated in the you know, top third or so. And then he wanted to go to the University of Maryland Law School, the flagship law school in his home city. And he couldn't because he was black. So he went to Howard Law School in Washington, DC. And there he encountered uh, a dean, Charles Hamilton Houston, the dean of Howard Law School, turned out to be the first African-American who was admitted to the Harvard Law Review. So if you ever go to the Harvard Law, Law Review building, it's a, it's, a, it's a historic building called Gannett House, there are pictures of every class, um, uh, you know, from the very, very beginning, but there's only one portrait. And it's not of Barack Obama, it's not of any of the Supreme Court justices, it's of Charles Hamilton Houston. And it is not because he was the first African-American admitted to the, the Law Review, that was not it alone. It was because he discovered Thurgood Marshall. When he was Dean, he saw this first year student, this scrappy kid from Baltimore. He was brash, he was loud. Um, and he saw in him a better writer, a better advocate, a better oralist, um, a better lawyer, a better jurist, a better leader than he had ever encountered. And he mentored him and he tutored him. Thurgood Marshall graduated at the top of his class from Howard, Howard Law School. And he could have gone to do anything, but he came back to Baltimore and he hung up a shingle and he decided to fight. And in his first year out of law school, he filed a lawsuit against the University of Maryland Law School for not admitting Blacks. Wow. He's just literally, first year out of law school. He made an argument no lawyer had ever made before. He made an argument no court had ever accepted before, and he won. The University of Maryland Law School became the first law school in the nation to be desegregated by an order of the court, by the highest court in Maryland. Um, and the same argument he made in 1932, one year out of law school, he made a version of that argument 20 years later when he argued Brown versus Board of Education before the United States Supreme Court, before he became, that kid was from Baltimore. Um, and I think it's a reminder that promise is everywhere. Um, and you just gotta unleash it. You know, some people often say, you know, um, why are you focused on such small things? You know, I don't think of Baltimore as, as small. I think it is one of the most ambitious undertakings anyone could ever do. I've said before that the mayor of Baltimore is the hardest job in the world. Um, and I'm maybe exaggerating, but not by much. Um, I, um, I think the power to sort of unleash those stories, whether it's my sister or um, Thurgood Marshall, um, is a very, very powerful privilege um, and it is, uh, at least to date, my way of um, repaying my sense of indebtedness to Baltimore, to my family, to the world. That was great. You're a great storyteller. You know, it's a great way to kind of segue from kind of, you know, the serious part of our discussion to the last part of what I typically kind of allocate is, uh, it's a fun game I call Creator Confessions. Basically, oh boy. I, ask, I ask you a bunch of things and you just kind of say the, you know, the first thing that kind of comes to your mind. All right. So, uh, here we go. So favorite Tamil food? Um, um, uh, uppams. Okay. Something that scares you? Heights. Favorite show you're watching? Oh, I'm watching a lot of good shows. Um, Shit's Creek. Mm, oh my Canadian God, show. a comedy Canadian. from Canada. That's yeah. right. I didn't, I didn't even, <laughs> incredible. Uh, a place you guys are funnier than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> a place you're itching to travel to after the pandemic is over? Sri Lanka. A fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? I guess you kind of did with your sister, but maybe somebody else. Uh, no, I'm going to stick with my sister. sister? Okay. Uh, one of the most creative voices in the country. Favorite childhood memory? God, great question. Um, when my Amma and Appa were first here, we bought an Oldsmobile Cutlass Classic station wagon. And they were trying to get their degrees at, while they were raising us. And... Uh, my mother would go to class and my father would stay in the station wagon with us in the back. And then my father would go to class and my mother would be there. And it was literally me and my sister in the back area of the station wagon, 
just hanging out. Um, it is a source of great joy. I have just like a fond, fond memory of that. Pet peeve. Uh, I don't like people that don't like double dipping. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, personal, uh, sorry, a person or celebrity that you look up to. Um, celebrity that I look up to. Michelle Obama. Age you want to retire by. Uh, Thurgood Marshall said that he uh, intended, because they asked him whether or not he was going to retire. And he said, um, I intend to be shot dead at the age of 110 uh, by a jealous husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know about the last part of that. But um, I, I hope I have the privilege of retiring no earlier than 80, following the footsteps of my father. Anything so, less than I'm, you know, I haven't even <laughs> kept up with him. <laughs> Celebrity whose life you'd want to experience for one day. Oh my God, these are hard questions. Um, celebrity one day. Let me come back to that one. Okay. And the last one is, a PSA you want to leave our audience with? You know, um, I, I will, uh, let, me, let me start with the, the, um, the celebrity for a day. Um, I think there are a lot of people that live very, very cool lives. Um, I think, um, I don't know that I agree uh, with everything he does, but the life of an Elon Musk, uh, to see what he sees and to, uh, think the way he thinks that must be fascinating for a day. <laughs> um, the, uh, the um, PSA is this. Um, I think in the South Asian community and so many minority communities, we do not take our health as seriously as we need to. Um, and uh, even when you do, life is not always kind. Um, but uh, we owe it to ourselves, to our children, uh, to our parents to learn from their lessons uh, that our time on this earth is limited. Uh, and there are things that we can do to give ourselves just a little bit more of it. Um, and so as much as, you know, we love our doses and our curries, mm -hmm. I, I, I urge people to take seriously that. Um, I have to, you know, say this to my parents every day. Um, I have to have it said to me every day. Um, we don't always, you know, live by what we preach, but if I could preach one thing, it would be to, you know, find an excuse to exercise, find a way to make healthy eating a part of your life, um, because it means your children will get to see a lot more of you for, a, 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 you know, as we all share this planet together. Great message. Um, you know, that kind of concludes the podcast. And, you know, I think I learned a ton about you and like, just, you know, fascinating history of like Baltimore and just kind of you know, the histories of these cities. So I think our audience is going to really love this episode. Um, if they've been really inspired and kind of, you know, want to get connected with you or just kind of, you know, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to work together. Who knows? Maybe somebody in the city of Baltimore is listening. Who knows? Um, what's the best way to kind of get a hold of you or connect with you? Feel free to email me anytime. Uh, my personal email is um, the roof for Baltimore, T H I R U F O R. Baltimore, B-A-L-T-I-M-O-R-E at gmail.com. Awesome. I'd love to hear from people and um, whether you are inspired to help in Baltimore or anywhere else, um, it's always nice to connect with people around the world. Awesome. And thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. No, thank you, Thero. And, you know, before we let you guys kind of jump off, just a final note for the audience, if you um, enjoy this podcast, or if you don't, please give it five out of five stars. It really helps increase your visibility on whatever your platform you're listening to, whether that's Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. Please comment, share, and like our stuff on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And if you have any feedback or ideas on future guests or topics, reach out to me at hello at the .com. Well, thank you again, Thiru, for your time. And uh, you've been such a pleasure to talk to. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys.